Chapel one battle That happened <laughs> 17 years ago. They opened, Danny opened the business. I said, for open the business meeting, first thing Danny says, where we asked the pastor to leave, and I thought, what did I do? <laughs> they just wanted to give me a raise, but they didn't. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we uh, pick up our message for the evening. Our Heavenly Father, we have taken some prayer requests tonight, and we're going to lift those up to you now. I want to pray for our brother Clayton, who evidently has uh, some vertigo problems along with the back issues. I ask that you be with him in his life, that you be with Chad's parents, uh, especially his dad now, and touch them, give them safety and protection, and for his friend Aubrey with the I know one of the vessels in his heart is 100% blocked. Can't do surgery. Lord, you're the great physician. You can even heal that. And we ask if it be your will that you would do that. Pray for our sister-in-law's, my sister-in-law's travel coming up this week. And they would have safety and a good visit and a good time there. Pray for uh, Darlene and having the problems where she feels like she's passing out. For James, who's having the ultrasound and Lord, pray that all this goes well. He gets all this test and they can do the surgery that's needed to help him feel better and get back on his feet. <clears throat> and I ask that you'd be with all those on our prayer list and work in their lives according to your perfect will. And tonight, Father, we'll be opening your word again. And as we always do, that's why we're here. Our service is centered around your holy word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would enlighten that word for us. I know that this section is going to step on some toes this evening. Here on Father's Day, the fathers are going to get their toes stepped on just a little bit. But we need that from time to time to get us where we need to be. So Father, work in our hearts this evening. Help us to see what you want us to see. And help us to do what you want us to do. And we pray as always in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Peter, I'll be reading so chapter 3. I put down the wrong chapter and when I sent it to Norma too. Verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. Let him skew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their, their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it's better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. You know, last Sunday we looked at the God's plan for the believing wife and the unbelieving husband. And so the husbands don't feel left out. Peter comes around to them, just as Paul did over in Ephesians. He says, likewise, ye husbands. Likewise makes this a very powerful verse because as I mentioned before, 
many men think that God gives him absolute power, absolute command over the wife, but that's not true. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with him according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Biblically, the wife is to submit to her husband, at least to the point where it doesn't damage her witness. We talked about that last week. Therefore, the husband is to willingly submit also to the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. The husbands who want to be the dictator need to realize they are not the, the head. They have a head over them, and that's Jesus. So the husband has to submit there. And so for all those men who think there's some sort of dictator, they need to realize that there's someone to whom they are in subjection, someone they are accountable to. Yet that takes you down a page or two when you realize that. As you read in verse 7, you, you get the impression that Peter now is talking to a couple who are both Christians. He talked to a believing wife about an unbelieving husband, but now it appears that he's talking to couples who are rightly joined together. And I believe, though, that these instructions are applicable whether the husband is a believer or not. If he's an unbeliever, the wife is still going to be witnessing to him by her, her lifestyle, her conversation. A husband, and it doesn't matter whether or not he's a believer, is told to treat his wife as the weaker vessel. In this manner, he gives honor to the wife. Honor means to regard with great respect. No, oh, that, that kind of hurts. Great respect. Husbands, what does it mean to give honor to your wife? It means to treat her with great respect. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. Well, there's no doubt about it. I'm old-fashioned. But in this case, old-fashioned means biblically correct. You know, in most cases, old-fashioned means being biblically correct. It's an amazing thing. And being old-fashioned regardless of what the world, that lost world out there tells us. I believe that a woman wants to be a woman just as a man wants to be a man. It's a lie from the pit that tells us that I feel like a little girl today and a little boy tomorrow. That's a lie from the devil. You know, God does not make mistakes. You were created by the mighty hand of God. Every one of us were created by God. And he created you just as said it. He created male and female. He does that still today. He created you female. You're a female. If he created you male, you're a male, period. And there's no exception. I don't care what the world says. There's no, no, no exception at all. I don't care what the world says. The world is governed by Satan himself. If it's counter to the Bible, you know Satan is the one in charge. And that's what he's doing. I want to be governed by what God says. Okay, let me, I'm going to try to get off that road again because I get down these one-way streets and it's hard for me to turn around. I'm going to get back to the evening service here. Since the wife is the weaker vessel, she is to be treated with honor. She is to be given first place by the husband. Now, when I say first place, we know Jesus is the center of any marriage. But he, she is to be first place in his life. I'm going to step on my toes now, and probably all the husbands here. But to honor you, does she get in the car first? Do you hold the door for her anymore? I don't see a lot of head bobbing here because it doesn't happen. When you both enter a room, does she go first? When you walk down the road together, the husband's supposed to be on the side of the street. You still do that? It's for her own protection. If you're walking down the street and the car splashes water, you're the one that's supposed to get wet. I'm not being old-fashioned. I'm saying respect here. I know many people say, boy, Melvin, you sure are old-fashioned. And boy, you're behind the times. This is a time of equal rights for women. Well, I believe that women should have equal rights. They should get paid the same salary for the same job. They should have all the rights. But we're talking now about what God says about marriage between a husband and a wife. And the husband is to treat the wife with great respect, great honor. Let me tell you that 
When a woman loses her place, it doesn't elevate her. It actually causes a downward spiral in her life. When she takes her biblical place in marriage, she can be treated with honor and she's given her rightful place. I think every husband ought to treat his wife as someone special. And she is. If she can put up with you, if Dana can put up with me, they're special people. You know? I get irritable sometimes. You know? And I, and I, I kind of growl like an old bear. I know you husbands don't do that, but uh, we do, don't we? And that's not what we're supposed to do. Husbands, we also have a tendency to forget these things. Over the years, we get comfortable. We begin, we forget to act as the gentleman we should be. I want you to think back. I know it's, it's hard because a lot of you, but think back to when you were dating. Didn't you do all those things I talked about before? Didn't you open the door? Didn't you walk on the outside? Didn't you take her in? When it rained, didn't you make sure she stayed dry? Of course you did. It's something, it's not something new that we should be doing, just starting. It should be, you know, we need to rid ourselves of old habits and return to the place where we honor our wives. Now, there's a powerful reason that the husband should follow biblical instructions. First, because God says so. But Peter says that your prayers be not hindered. As I said, Jesus is the center of your marriage. He should be the center of your life. If you're not getting along as husband and wife, your family worship is ruined. And the result is there's no use praying. Because there's friction. And that friction keeps you away from being able to open your heart to the Lord. If you're fighting like cats and dogs, well, God doesn't hear cats and dogs. He cares about them, but cats and dogs can't Talk to the Lord. And if you're fighting like that, you look like that, and God says, how am I supposed to hear that prayer? They're not even close to what they should be. Now, let me say something else right here and now. Marriage is something that our almighty God gave to the entire human family, and it was just not instituted for Israel or for the church, but for the world. Genesis tells us that God created man in his own image, by the way, and when he created man, man was alone. You ever thought about that? Being alone. I don't believe Adam stayed alone very long. It's a very short period of time. I think the reason that God allowed Adam to be alone for a short period of time was that he would realize that something was missing in his life. It's at that point where the Bible tells us that God took man and caused a deep sleep to fall on him and he created man from created woman from man genesis says she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man she's called in genesis 2 18 a helpmate for him that is a help that was fit for him you know god put it together perfectly i think it might be helpful for us to understand it something like this she was the other half of man she completed him. Now alone, Adam was only half a man. And when God created Eve, he created the other half. God doesn't make mistakes. Everything is perfect. I believe that if you hold that thought in your mind, you can plainly see that the marital relationship is not to be one of a man acting like a dictator, insisting on treating his wife like a little child or who's supposed to jump at his every command but that the wife is there to help him. She is his helpmate. She's there to be part of him. And she's there to love him. And husbands, you're there to love and protect your wife. That is the ideal relationship in marriage. Now I want to say something else here. And it's not going to be met with applause from the world, from its evil anti-God agenda. Oh, they're going to jump on me. Biblically, which is God's way, and it's the only way, marriage is between one man and one woman. Period. That's it. Bend the truth as much as you dare. 
deny the truth of God's word if you that's what you want to your desire of your heart and live a life that God calls an abom abomination but you and you alone are responsible for the decisions you make and those who stand up and endorse and take part are guilty of violating and willingly violating the commands of God one man one woman that's it no two men no two women that's from the pit of hell. Now, I'm not the morality police. I want you to understand that. I'm not going to hold up protest signs. I'm not going to go out and condemn those people. But rather, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray that they would come to know the Lord and be saved. And when they do, they'll come out of those things. And I'm going to ask you too to pray for their salvation. Because we're not going to hate them to the cross. We have to love them to the cross. And that's where so many Christians go wrong. They demonstrate hatred rather than love. You know, that's the only thing that's going to bring their new life in Christ is to come to Jesus. That's going to change their entire life. Don't hate the person. Don't hate the sinner. You can hate the sin, but love the sinner. Sadly, many Christians have the wrong idea and they try to condemn the sinner rather than trying to attempt to love them to the cross. And that's where people say, well, that's a hate-filled bunch. We have to show love. The church of Jesus Christ is not about hate. It is all about love. When Jesus went to the cross, he went for all sinners. All they have to do is come to him by faith and repent of their sins. That's it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Regardless of the sin you've committed, Still, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Now, husbands, I'm going to let you off the hot seat now because Peter only gave us one verse to talk to you about that. Now he wants to talk about conduct in the church. So now you just change from one side to the other because here we go. He said, I thought I was off the hook and now here comes another attack. Well, it's for our own good. Finally, you know, when you hear those words, I know when you hear that in a sermon, you get excited. I see people start to smile and they look at their watch and Peter says, finally, but he's not done yet either. Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one for another. Love his brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Basically, this is pretty much like I, what I mentioned about our attitude toward the sinner. Born again believers are to be like-minded, they're to be sympathetic, they're to be tender-hearted, they're to be courteous, and they are to be loving. And I, he's thinking, well, Pastor, can't you add a few more things on my back there? My knees can take just a little bit more. Born-again believers are to be humble-minded. Being humble-minded means we are not to lord it over anyone. That's to be the attitude and the action of the believer among other believers. In short, that's to be the attitude of the church. Don't be such a high and mighty attitude in person. Don't think that you're holier than thou. Remember, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the church. I like to remind everybody that because so often, if I, oh, I'm going to church. Well, this is a church building. You're the church. So when you're getting these instructions, if you could see Peter, he's, he'd be looking and pointing his finger at you and you and you and me. This is an individual command as well as a corporate one. As Christians, we are told not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but counterwise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called that ye should inherit a blessing. This simply involves something which we find very difficult to do, Turn the other cheek. Boy, do we have a hard time with that. If a brother or sister in Christ says something evil about you, something that's absolutely not true, you're not to strike back. You know, you just have to count to ten, whatever it is. Don't strike back. I think I told you I had a physics teacher in high school and sometimes we'd get on our nerves. Can you imagine that? And she would go, two, four, six, eight, ten. And it helped her. But that's what we need to do. You need to 
wait. You need to be patient. You need to understand. Turn that other cheek. Rather than firing back with both barrels, as we have a tendency to do. And don't try to deny it because I know everybody in here has got that spiritual shotgun and it's where you hear it, you hear it click when somebody does something to you. I know that we all do. We need to take what that brother and sister has done to us or what they've said about us, take it to the Lord. Turn the other cheek, take it to the Lord. If we go take that to the Lord in prayer, we turn the problem over to Him, just like we read about Mary and Martha today, talking to Jesus, send that message to Jesus. We do the same thing, Lord, I've had some things said about me. And just tell Him about it. You know, and you can be assured that the Lord is going to take care of the situation. And He's going to take care of that person. You may not see it. And it doesn't matter. It's not our job. God will take care of it. That doesn't mean that person that you, you attack is going to be struck by, attack you is going to be struck by lightning. But you can be sure. It may just be something that the Lord just convicts their heart. I'll tell you what, the Lord can convict your heart and just melt you down like butter. He can take your heart and bend it around so that you go to that person and say, I'm just so sorry. I really didn't mean to do that. I shouldn't have done it. But the Lord's going to deal with that person, convicting their heart, and He's going to cause a change in that life. I guarantee you He will. If we take this biblical position, you're going to find that all those little cliques are going to disappear. And all the infighting within the church will be gone if we just give it to the Lord and quit trying to do it ourselves. Well, I'm going to get so-and-so. He Let it go. Those words are so important. Let it go. Give it to the Lord. Please remember that you and I are representing the Lord Jesus Christ and no one loves you more than He loves you. And if you're a Christian, you're following His way, you need to start loving more. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. I want to tell you, old Peter is really doing some pretty hard toe stomping, isn't he? Mm. We've loaded that shotgun. We pulled that trigger. Now the toe stomping was needed. It was needed then. It's needed today. You know, if your toes don't get stomped on, something's wrong. Nobody's living a perfect life. I'm going to tell you right now. I wish we could, but we don't. And we get stomped on. And when we get stomped on, it makes us start to think. And the Lord starts to work on our heart. You know, every one of us wants to live. But sadly, there are not many believers today that are enjoying life as they should. There's some that are not enjoying life. There are Christians who are not living life to the fullest. They're not getting what they should out of this life. If you really want to live, here's a good formula. And here's the key to it all. We are to refrain from constantly speaking evil of others. Quit it. You know? We need to refrain from that. If somebody does something wrong, you don't have to point it out. You don't have to be the judge and jury. You're not supposed to be judging anyway. Don't speak evil of others. And if you do refrain from speaking guile, that is, you are to stop being deceptive and stop not telling the truth. I think we all know how difficult it is to curb the tongue. Boy, that tongue can get you in so much trouble so fast. We get angry and then we speak before we think. Oh man. And especially if you've got a temper. If you've got a temper, it can just blow up on you. You need, you know, when I was at the dentist last week, he had to keep putting things to block my tongue, little bridges and things, because the tongue wanted to go where it wanted to go. And that's the way it is when we speak. That tongue says those things it wants to say. We need to hush. Next time you have the desire to say something you shouldn't, I want you to think about an Andy Griffith episode. Remember when Ernest T. was going to join the army? And we'd say, ah, 
and we looked in his ears. Ah, oh, no, no. What do I say with the ears? Hush, hush. That's what I want you to do. When so, you get ready to say something, hush. Don't say it. Far too many times we talk when we should remain silent. When you say nothing, it can't be held against you. And many times we speak out of anger, we speak out of hurt, we speak out of jealousy. And I think we all understand that words can hurt. They do. I can remember words that hurt me when I was just little. I can still think about those things. You can't take it back. You can't disregard what's been said. You know, when you watch a movie about a courtroom, the judge will say, disregard what was said. How do you disregard what you've heard? You can't do it. Once you say it, you can't take it back. Think before you speak and remember that we are to love one another. Then Peter tells us, let us eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Born again believers, not just to sit back, act piously, looking down on others because they're not living up to our standards. What do our standards have to do with it? Think about it. We set up our own standards for other people. Do you live up to your own standards? No, we don't. We overlook our faults, don't we? Be honest. But you sure see the fault with the other people. You know, like Jesus, I see the speck in your neighbor's eye and you can't see, I'm going to bring it up today, you can't see that two by four that's in yours. That plank. You know, in truth, you're not living up to your own standards. That's a fact. Christians should live it up in their life. You, know that? you should live it up, but not the way the world decides, thinks you ought to live it up. The fact of the matter is that you should. We live it up by not in, indulging in gossip and evil and the things of the world. The Christians have a good time. You know, the world goes out and they say, I'm having a good time. And then they get up the next morning, their head hurts, they're sick. What else? That sound like a good time to me. But we have a good time. We enjoy the time we have with the Lord. We enjoy time one with another. I want you to think back though to a time before you came to Jesus Christ for salvation. What did you consider living it up in those days? Think back. You can remember that. Was it drinking? Was it running around doing things which are, were evil and, and looked upon as a world as fun things? You did. Were you thinking about Jesus? Were you thinking about your sins? Were you thinking about the fact that you were heading directly to hell? No. You weren't. Your thoughts were on what you could do, what you could find that was fun, whether it's what you should be doing or not, that's what you were focusing on. You were living it up. Now, here's another question. Where are the friends that you hung around with before you were saved? I'm sure you've noticed that those who are still lost, they avoid you like the plague don't they? They don't want to talk to you. If you pass them on the street, it's hello, how you doing? And off they go. Because you're conviction to their heart. The way you live it up bores them. Because they're still serving the prince of the power of the air. Well, now you're saved. And let's, let's live it up for the Lord today and every day. You need to understand how important that is. It's interesting that we live it up today by doing things we used to think were a waste of time. Oh, I could be doing something else. You know, today it's going to church rather than going to the golf course. Attending Bible study rather than going to the bar. And the list goes on and on. When you come to Jesus Christ, your life has changed. The things that you find enjoyment in, they change. You find enjoyment in new places. A new way. For well, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and the ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Let me tell you, that's a powerful passage. Peter's quoting here from Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. 
the face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Every believer needs to take that psalm to heart. It's something the Word of God emphasizes so much. Our great and loving God has guaranteed us to hear our prayers. He hears the prayers of those who belong to Him. But if you notice, there is no guarantee to hear the prayers of those who are not His. Wow. Listen up. The only prayer that a sinner can pray and know that God is listening and going to answer it is, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and I ask you to accept me. Then he has the ability to go boldly before the throne of grace. That is a prayer that God will hear and God will answer. But you know, the world today has been influenced by Hollywood. Those movies, some of them are entertaining, but biblically, they're a nightmare. But one of the things, you know, we look at this at Hollywood and we see some of the things that happen there. One of them you see over and over again this wicked old man who's an unbeliever, has no, no place for God in his heart, and his, maybe his young daughter or granddaughter is sick, and he comes in and he gets on his knees and prays, and the girl jumps up out of bed. He expects God to answer that prayer. That's where the movies and the novels tell it, isn't it? That old reprobate comes home and finds a little girl sick or in the hospital. He calls on the Lord to raise her up. It's a sentimental story. But let me add this, it's nonsense. It's absolutely unscriptural. It's not biblical. There is no guarantee that God hears the unbeliever. The first thing that unbeliever needs to do if God's going to hear his prayer is to get right with God by coming to Jesus Christ for salvation. Then God will hear and answer his prayers. It's a false idea. It's a lie from Satan that makes people think that you can call on God under any circumstances whether or not you're a child of His. If you're His child, you can come anytime, any place, anywhere, for any reason. God in His Holy Word, though, has not promised to hear the prayers of those who are not His own. Ecclesiastes 2.17, we read a statement of a man who has tried everything in life. He lived like a reprobate. Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought on brought under the sun is grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. I wonder how many people today are involved in living for things that are of this world and then all of a sudden they come to realization it's not worth it. I've worked all my life for money, money, power. And then they come to the point that what am I doing this for? See, that type of life is monotonous. It's just not worth it. No wonder so many people, and, and the number has really risen in our day, to commit suicide. They have no hope. This life means nothing to them. Until you get in the right relationship with God, you are never going to live life to the fullest. I don't care how much joy you get out there, or what you perceive as joy, how much fun you have, no matter where you go, you're not going to live it to the fullest. But that doesn't mean that the believer lives on a high plane far above the problems of the world. Doesn't mean that at all. Let's see what Peter says writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Does that mean God has given you a big suit of armor to put on so that no one can touch you? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, righteousness sake happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Suffering for that which is right should bring joy to the child of God. Joy in suffering? Sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? Some Christians, thinking they're taking a stand for the Lord, actually make themselves obnoxious in their witness to others. And I'm sure you've met some. They just... Well, it's just awful. They're just so overbearing, so I know it all. It's really a bad situation. They run people off. But if we have simply taken a quiet stand 
to the right and for God. We ought to rejoice if we suffer for that. <clears throat> that means we're doing something right. Christians, you are not going to escape suffering in this world if you're truly a born-again child of God. You know, someone said, that, and it's so true, it really is, Jesus often spoke of Christianity as a banquet, but never a picnic. Isn't that true? We have so much to choose from. It's like having a meal here at church. But it's not a picnic. You know, we're going to have problems. Jesus never told the believer that we're going to have it easy down here. He never promised us a rose garden. But, there's that little word again, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that seeketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In the simplest terms that I can come up with, this means you ought to know more than just a little bit of the Bible. Hmm. You know, I would love to be able to remember what I have forgotten about the Bible. As you move through the Bible and you learn here, you have to go back and start again because we can't remember it all. But you need to know more than just a little bit. You know, it's terrible that today there are so many people who profess to be Christians and yet the skeptics, those false teachers, can tie them in knots. Why is that? Why can the cults and the false teacher take believers and just bend them every which way? It's because they don't know even a little of the Word of God. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Today you have a little sanctuary. Did you know that? A little, little chapel in your heart. And during the course of the day, I don't care if you're driving the car, hiking in the mountains, sitting in the office, if you're in a classroom, you still have a little chapel in your heart. You can withdraw to there. You can sanctify the Lord in that little chapel of your heart. You don't have to have a building. Did you know that? He's with you always. Go sanctify the Lord. Set Him aside. He's special. If you have that within your heart, I'm going to tell you, the people around you will know that you belong to God. And you will have coming out of your mouth the right things all the time. You're not going to make yourself obnoxious. You're not going to have that pious attitude that people will know that you humbly live your life and that you love the Lord. What a major difference it would be if Christians today would sanctify Jesus Christ in their hearts. If every Christian would do that. We need to do it, all of us. Habakkuk wrote, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Pay attention, Christians. On Sunday and Wednesday evenings, and you're coming to church, you're driving out there, the world is passing you by, isn't it? You see kids playing in the fields, the ones that come away from the computer. You see people heading back and forth to the beach or any kind of worldly entertainment. The world's passing you by. Obviously, the world is not keeping silent before the Lord. When I was growing up, there was such an uproar in the sanctuary before service. Everybody was talking. And there were some people who wanted to, to read and meditate, read the passage for the day, to maybe spend some time in silent prayer. And it got to the point where Habakkuk 2.20 was actually put in the bulletin. And they put something on the back. I can't remember exactly the wording, but it says, some people wish to meditate in silence before the Lord prior to the service. Keep silent before the Lord. The Lord's in His holy temple. And we live in a world that just passes God. But they're not be keeping silent. Don't be, don't be like the world. We as individual Christians need to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of good conversation in Christ. Make sure that those people who speak evil of you are an error. 
that it's not true. You live the right and proper way. You live the way Jesus wants you to live. And you won't give them opportunity to accuse you of evil things. They will certainly accuse you falsely because that's what the world does best. You know, Satan is the ruler of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. And Jesus said he's a liar and the father of lies. And he's going to lie about you if he gets any opportunity at all. Now, they will certainly accuse falsely. But live right, walk right, as Peter basically says. Have a good conscience so that when you hear the rumors about yourself, it's not going to bother you because you know it's not true. You live the life that honors Christ. For it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. If you suffer for Christ's sake, you can rejoice in that. I'm doing it for the Lord. That sounds strange you know, that the, for the world to rejoice over suffering, but suffering for the Lord's sake should cause you to rejoice. We have great examples. Every one of the apostles suffered for the sake of Christ. Early Christians suffered. There are Christians today who are seriously suffering. So pay attention to what I'm about to say. If you're suffering because you have played the fool, because you've gotten into trouble and into sin, then that's a different situation. If you're suffering because you did something wrong, don't take joy in that. Just learn from it. But if you're suffering for the Lord, take joy. Take joy that you're honoring the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank You for the time tonight for the business meeting and for the prayer request time, for the music. And I thank you that you really did some serious toe stomping on us this evening. We need that, Lord. We need to have our lives straightened out from time to time, probably every single day. And I thank you, Father, that on this Father's Day that you let the husbands know that they have a job to do in the home to honor you and to give great respect and honor to their wives. And as a church family, we need to let the world see Jesus in us. We need to have that sanctifying sanctuary of our heart to honor Jesus Christ. Father, I know that there are times coming we're going to suffer for the cause. Let us rejoice in that. Take joy in it. Now, Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit work in every life, meet every need, and as we leave tonight, give us protection, bring us again back at the next appointed time, and please allow us to be the best witnesses by the way we live our life that we possibly can be. Let the world may see Jesus in us, and it's in His wonderful name that we pray.